Hey folks, I'm Will Jarvis. Along with my dad, Dr. David Jarvis, I host the podcast Narratives. Narratives is a project exploring the ways in which the world is better than it has been, the ways it is worse, and the past toward making a better, more definite future. I hope you enjoy it. All right. Good evening. We're sitting here. It's uh, it's about how cold is it? It's pretty cold. It's cool. Out on the porch here, recording podcast here in Durham, North Carolina. And today we want to talk a little bit about WHR Rivers. So I'll, I'll just go ahead and give you the Wikipedia bio because he's uh, quite an interesting guy. Uh, so William Hall's Rivers was an English anthropologist, neurologist, ethnologist, psychiatrist, best known for his work treating First World War officers who were suffering from shell shock in order to return them to combat. Have you seen Homecoming, the new TV show? Uh, no, I haven't, but okay, now no. I will. It's all about that. It's like, uh, you know, oh, what if we could erase folks' memories and send them right back to the front? Um, Rivers' most famous patient was the poet Siegfried Sassoon. Have you ever read any Sassoon poetry? Not until today. Oh, really? Yeah, so I, I took a graduate-level English course at UNC with Professor Armitage, who we talked about on the podcast. We talked about Sassoon a fair bit, and Sassoon was good friends with Wilfred Owen, I think was probably more talented, but they were both uh, world, famous World War I poets. Um, and a lot of people forget about World War I because it's overshadowed by World War II. And uh, anyway, there's a lot of good poetry, especially on the English side, that came out. Um, so he's friends with Siegfried Sassoon. And during the early years of the 20th century, Rivers developed many new lines of psychological research. In addition, he was the first to use a double-blind procedure in investigating physical and psychological effects um, of the consumption of tea, alcohol, and drugs. So the first kind of psychological RCT that was ever done, which is really interesting. I mean, it's funny enough, you know, people are now just applying RCTs to economics. I mean, this is the, you know, the most recent Nobel Prize. Man, was it the most recent? Which actually, did you know that Econ Nobel Prize is not a Nobel Prize? I did not know that. It's not a real Nobel Prize. Yeah, that's a fu fun fact for the day. Uh, the dismal science. Uh, so he is also notable for having participated in the Tories Island Strait, Strait Islands Expedition of 1898 and his um, consequent seminal work on the subject of kinship. So tell us what RCTs are. It's a randomized control trial. So the idea is you're, you're trying to sniff out real effects. So if you gave someone, you know, we're going to randomize this group of people and we're going to give them each a different treatment and see which one will have a control where they don't get any treatment and see which one, you know, has different effects. So coffee, you, you could tease out, you know, well, does coffee amp you up or does beer amp you up? Which one? Well, for beer, it's like it's like this up curve and down curve, right? So it's a small amounts. It's uh, it's it's a makes you excited. And then with more amounts, it's a depressive. So. So are RCTs being employed for the coronavirus vaccine? Sure. So like these uh, vaccines they're testing right now, the Moderna, Pfizer, that's where you can see like it's X amount effective and things like that. That's what they're using. It's kind of the gold standard, the double blind. So what was interesting about the Torres Strait Islands expedition? So I think maybe we should back up a little bit and we should talk about why we're talking about WHR rivers today. So I found WHR Rivers recently when I was reading a book called Secrets of Our Success by Joe Henrich, I want to say is his last name. I've only read it, so don't quote me. He's an anthropologist at Harvard, and he writes a lot about cultural evolution. So how culture affects you know, biological evolution and how cultures can evolve and uh, things of that na nature. And he was talking about how different technologies can actually disappear. So uh, we we really like to talk about progress on the podcast, about whether things have gotten better, are they getting worse, and what ways are they better, what ways are they worse, are they worse? And I think a lot of people have this view of technology as this curve that he heads up straight, um, kind of up and to the right, if that makes sense. But... You know, WHR Rivers, he wrote this. It's not very long, actually. What's it called again? It's called the 
Disappearance of Useful Arts, I want to say. That's it. Where he talks about different technologies that um, have disappeared from certain parts of Polynesia that were once widespread. So he talks about canoes, uh, bow and arrows, and there's other examples that he doesn't mention, such as fire. So fire is actually a technology that we've had and lost a couple times. I think people don't realize that. And um, canoes, another example in Polynesia here, bow and arrows. This also happened in Greenland with the Inuit. There was a, a pathogen that came through and wiped out all of the elders and a certain group of Inuit in Greenland. And they lost the ability to create seafaring kayaks for a significant amount of time until they contacted other Inuit groups and relearned the ability to do that. So it, this is just really interesting to me because it's an example of um, two, you know, you, you make maybe two steps forward and you come one back or something like that and how important um, cultural learning and transfer is in technological process and that things can go backward at times. It's not always this rush forward that we kind of think of because we live in this information age and the, you know, the X iPhone is a little bit better than last year and it just gets better and better. As a more modern example, at the end of the Cold War, which is 1990 when the Berlin Wall fell, um, the United States made the decision to continue to manufacture, build, nuclear submarines in Mystic, Connecticut. They built two a year because they wanted to not lose the technology to build them. And last year they had some significant problems about welding. Really? Yeah. I just read that the other day. So we can lose modern technology as well and take some measures to try to avoid that having happen. That's very interesting. So they just weren't able to use the same welding techniques that uh, they were having, tr they were struggling with it. Was putting them behind. I don't know that they've lost them. Gotcha. But you can imagine if you if you had some tradespeople that were welders that did very specific kinds of welds, and they started to age out and they weren't replaced with a young workforce, you would lose the ability to do that. And I don't know how much that played into it, but I know the Navy was having some problems with General Dynamics, who manufactures um, the submarines. Uh, and it was to do with welding welds. That's that's super that's super interesting. It seems like it seems like we've we've somewhat conquered this problem in that we have robust technology much more robust technologies for preserving information. So we have books, we have libraries, we have the internet, we have storage, we've got all these things. Have you ever heard of the Svalbard um I, excuse me if I butcher the pronunciation there uh seed vault no any chance oh that's the uh the seed vaults yeah that's, that's right. where they put them in uh remote places that are real cold so they it, it can keep seeds in case so you can just keep happens. them yeah in case bad things happen you can go back and you can actually grab them and feed everyone uh kind of managing tail and risk just in case so we have people think about this and we actually have technologies to prevent this from happening so you're mentioning welding and, and submarines uh, not, you know, us kind of losing that ability to do, do things recently. So I, I, I was, I've been reflecting on this. Did you know what the big innovation was for Wilbur and Orville Wright in the first airplane? Um, I'm going to say no. Okay. So the first big innovation they had, well, what, what their big key was that helped them solve it was they saw everyone and they saw people strapping bigger and bigger engines on these airplanes and, and colliders and everyone kept having problems. And what they thought was, well, you know what the real issue here, it's control. We don't know how to control an airplane. So they came up with the system of controlling an airplane with air loins and all these different things. Um, so they came up with control systems. So I, I find this fascinating because... What's been in the news recently? Have you heard of the 737 Max? Uh, that was that is the problem. Is it would cause some stall? Isn't it? That's right. So our our flagship aerospace company in the United States, Boeing, uh, has airplanes hurtling into the ground because they built. So they created a new 737. It's been in existence for a long time. Uh, they they pushed all the engineers out of the company. It's now run by marketing folks and. And uh, they decided, you know, we're going to create put more efficient engines on there, but we're not going to balance them correctly. We'll just manage it with software. Well, the software was faulty, and essentially, it 
the the planes would dive into the ground and there's nothing that the pilots could do to control them to pull them back up so i think it's just coming kind of somewhat full circle in that in the beginning the first thing we figured out was how to control airplanes and now we've kind of in some weird sense lost the ability to control them well i find that you know the spacex launch which i saw the other day right and uh you know we went to the moon uh 50 years ago that's right and now uh we've finally got back around to putting people into orbit that's right yeah we did, we had to use russian rockets for a while right yeah. and and a lot of this it's really weird right because if you look at the space shuttle so what what was the space shuttle trying to solve it was trying to solve reusability they're like look these rockets they're really expensive we're trying to make them cheaper but the space shuttle was very expensive and a very poor way to do things you know it took how many years till we got back to spacex to actually get there you know they retired the shuttle and you know one of my thoughts about NASA is that the truth about NASA is it's super bureaucratized and really not effective at all. Everyone thinks NASA is super cool, and it used to be super cool, but now it's just a bunch of bureaucrats up there that really can't do anything. I mean, they have to. I mean, they have to outsource their launch capability to these other companies. You know, like SpaceX. Well, that's probably and, the perfect thing to do is hand it to a capitalist. Right. Well, they they had to try something, right? Because it, it in some sense whatever was happening which we're not here to diagnose NASA's problems now, but some bad things were happening. They needed to, and perhaps, you know, more competition from the private sector will encourage them to actually get more back to their stated mission of, you know, space exploration and yeah. whatever they're doing. Yeah, I think par partnering with, with the private sector is probably a very good idea in any event. Otherwise, things become too heavily laden by the bureaucracy and bogs down. It is notable, however, that they were able to do it in the 60s quite effectively. So I, I don't think, like, I, I don't know. I, I'm fairly libertarian myself, but I'm not carte blanche against government action. I think there's a there's some weird sense in, in, in that libertarian critiques have gotten more true over time because the government works less well. Like, back in the day, in the 60s, back in the day, uh, you know, in the 60s, the 50s, there's some sense that the government was able to accomplish its stated goals much better than it is now. And, and now things are much more entrenched and they're much more lethargic and unable to actually do anything effectively. Yeah, that's changed. And, my, and, and I think it's, there's, you could spend many hours speaking about why it's changed and, and why it persists. But yeah, it was different then for certain. Definitely. You want to talk about kinship? Cause it's in here. What, uh, what WHR Rivers thought about kinship? Well, first I want to talk a little bit about uh, some other. So I, I want to talk more broadly about WHR Rivers and his life as an experience. So it's interesting. His sister talks a lot about how he would come home um, while he was a ship surgeon and he would sleep, you know, a, a long time throughout the day and only work about four hours a day. You know, he, this guy is like he only ends up working about four hours a day and, and yet he's able to do this huge body of work so you know all this work in psychology and and anthropology and this extremely wide-ranging amount of interest in fact so uh, did you read it all about repression in preparing for the podcast uh, i didn't read about repression i did read the parts about how he would sleep 20 hours a day or only yeah. work four hours a day may not be sleeping. yeah so he uh it, it's interesting that he actually was the first psychologist psychiatrist to figure out that Hey, maybe the best way to deal with people's all the th modern thinking at during his time was that you would just repress your problems. So, you know, you had this traumatic incident and you would just repress the memory. And his thought was this was a terrible idea. You needed to confront it and actually talk to people about it. And this is actually modern therapy, essentially. Yeah, it's talk therapy, right? And right. It, that and, and now I recall that was in regards to the shell shocked veterans of world war one where he came up with those ideas that's right so he did the first rct in psychology uh extensive work on the history of polynesia not only just polynesia um uh, talked about the disappearance of useful arts how technologies can come and go uh he made these inroads in therapy for psychology and treating PTSD. So that's, they didn't know what to call it exactly. We called it shell shock at the time. And everyone else thought it was just a physical th problem. So, you know, they do like massages and hydrotherapy and things like that. Uh, so they weren't quite sure. So he, he, he was the first one to see all of these things clearly, and he's working four hours a day, which is pretty weird, right? 
Well, what do you, how, how productive do you think the average person actually is? If you're, you might say I'm working eight hours, but how many of those hours do you think you're actually, it's one actually productive? Right. So it's probably, it's probably much, it's less than that in actual productive time. So maybe if you're just focused, that that's really helpful. But his case is interesting because he seems to have done a lot more than people tend to do nowadays. If that makes sense. Like, I, I don't think anyone who listens to this podcast has probably heard of WHR Rivers, and yet he's made all of these advancements in all of these different fields, unrelated, fairly unrelated fields. And it makes you wonder, you know, what what's going on there? Why why aren't people able to cross over as much as they are? And I have this thought that a lot of what's going on is people are kind of talked out of their good ideas. So, you know, the, you know, WHR Rivers was probably encouraged to go try wacky stuff. Now people that are doing wacky stuff are kind of shunned. You're told, you know, you're talked out of all your good ideas. You're, you know, they say go figure out some stable source of income. And that could be uh, just more of a symptom of living in a low, lower growth society than anything else. I think that's part of it. And then I think part of it's because at that time, uh, you could do inspired thinking by knowing less. In other words, the bar to start the floor where you took off from was a lot lower. And now you have to, to have an inspired idea. You might have to know a lot more information. So that's the idea that uh, things have gotten. So the, the counterpart to what I've been saying is that perhaps things have just gotten a lot harder to do. But I, I almost think I, I'm, I, I, things may have gotten a little bit harder. I, I think they may have gotten a little bit harder, but at the same time, you know, we teach high school students calculus and we hadn't invented calculus until fairly recently in the grand scheme of human history is Isaac Newton, right? So what, what does that mean for us today? And I, I think people giving people permission to go and try and, and work on problems they're interested in and in different subject areas is something that we've gotten really bad at nowadays. So we've, you know, we really wanted to, I have this feeling that we really wanted to speed up progress during World War II and the Cold War to beat these existential threats, right? It, it, and it was framed as this, this uh, literally, you know, they're atheists and they're coming to kill us all, right? You know, it's like the, you know, the Germans, like these are, they're atheists, they're coming to kill us all, you know, the good guys versus the bad guys. The good bad guys, guys, the bad guys. It's an existential threat. You work you work 80 hours a week because you're trying to keep your kid from being killed and uh, in this air, air raid shelter ducking under the desk, right? So a lot of incentive to work hard. So we could, we could really speed things up. The university system, the grant funding system comes out of that. And we've got this extreme specialization because there were huge gains to be made in specialization at that time. So uh, I think... Perhaps what happened that maybe there's some story you could tell where there's this area era where WHR Rivers was alive, where you could be a generalist and you can make all these connections and you can make a lot of progress. But then we kind of reached our limits to that. So we pivoted to specialization for a while. But it seems like we've been in this this almost um, bear market for specialization where things have gotten so wrung out and the the people that work on super string theory are you know there's like a hundred of them it's impossible for us for us to evaluate whether they're actually saying anything that's true it's impossible for the rest of the entire world to evaluate whether it's what they're saying is true and uh, so these tiny tiny cabals of super experts in ultra unique areas start to miss easy gains that are um, found by more um, I guess cross disciplinary and people talk about that a lot, but more, more in believing that you could actually make a discovery. I think one of the big problems is, and I've talked about this a lot and argue with a lot of rationalists about this kind of idea, uh, because a lot of them, you know, there, there's some sense in which, so this is from Peter Thiel, but if you go to an evangelical Christian Bible study and you get the idea that you're, you don't have any sin and you're, everything's great. Uh, you've got the wrong message, right? <laughs> you got the wrong message. Uh, and there's this idea if you go to like a modern rationalist meetup, and I run one, so I like take take it this as you will. And we try not, we try to 
allow for more human agency, I'd like to think. But and if you get the idea that humans um, are really good at thinking and are super able and they don't have any biases and there's no psychological biases to worry about and the brain's not flawed, um, you've gotten the wrong message. So in, in the same sense. So I think what this ignores is that human agency is extremely powerful and you have to believe that you can um, accomplish something to have any chance at accomplishing it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's a necessary but not sufficient um, thing to do. And I think we've, we're in this world where we're just due for this bull market of believing you can do things and ideas and generally approaching problems because we just don't do that anymore, right? This is interesting. Uh, when did you, you entered undergraduate school in 2012? That's right. And when we went to orientation the first time, I spoke to the va va vice chancellor of student affairs. Winston Crisp? Yes. Yeah. And Winston said, I, and I asked him about this, he said, this is the most capable group of kids. And he didn't mean just your, your, your class, your right. year, but the most recent history that we've ever seen. And a lot of it's because we did, we, we raised that generation and told them, you can do everything. I and mean, it wasn't that give a trophy to everybody that participated. And so we gave them that that perspective that you can do anything. You just got to figure out, you just got to dream it. Right. But but for some reason, it, it like, I think it was the wrong message in that. I, I, I think that narrative is somewhat, is definitely somewhat true. And I think it, it's the wrong narrative for a couple of reasons. The economic situation on the ground does not quite match up, right? There's less opportunities. Things are, like, much more static. Second, um, it's more this general optimistic tone. Like, I, I think Peter Thiel talks about this, too. We're harping on him a lot. Didn't expect to. But it's uh, indefinite optimism. So it's like things are going to be better. You can do anything. Uh, but there's no, like, concrete, okay, the – the future that I'm going to build myself is going to be different in these very concrete ways. So I'm going to go get a farm, have, uh, you know, lots of land and, you know, it's going to be really nice and pleasant and things like that. That would be a concrete future for myself. Right. Instead it's like, Oh, things are just going to be better, generally better. And you see this in this growth of like, what are the most sought after professions nowadays, high status professions that, elite universities like Carolina and Duke and one more like top end of Carolina, but Duke and Harvard, MIT, Yale, but it's uh consulting and like, what is consulting? Well, this, the sell of consulting, which is like, it is attractive, but it's just like ultimate optionality, ultimate up in upside. So it's like, well, you go work in consulting and you'll get exposure to tons of industries. You kick the can down the road and, uh, and you'll have more opportunities down the down the road instead of I, I think the problem with that is that it's just kicking the decision down later if that makes sense and consulting could be a great gig you know you can make a lot of money if you have student loans they'll shy away from it right because you'll make a lot of money and pay that off get it to see the world but it, it, it does in some sense ignore the fact that you need to make real hard progress you need to have good ideas and you need to go out and try and implement them. And they're abundant. I mean, good ideas are abundant. I, I was thinking about this a couple of days ago on a, a drive with a friend. And we were talking, you know, about um, drug addiction in the United States and opioid addiction. And, you know, we had these amazing tools to address these problems. And those two amazing tools are contingency management. Have you ever heard of contingency management? I oh, know I can figure out what that means, but I'm not sure how what in the real world it means. Let these me days. let me make sure I got the term right because I got this actually. I was helping Abby study my wife for um, her exam, in uh, she's a master's of social work student, and it's a uh, and it was her class on addictions. And I read about contingency management. I'm like, man, that is super smart. And so I read further. And I was like, wow, why don't we use this for everything? It works so well. They're like, this really replicates. So contingency management is, okay, I will pay you. I will give you rewards if you are abstinent from opioids. So if you don't take, uh, you know, if you have 
a clean test, you get X dollars. And it costs, it, and the dollar threshold can be much lower than people realize uh, for these things. And it works incredibly well. Like it, and not, not okay, I'm going incredibly well. I don't want to hype it up too much, but it works quite well. So you could use contingency management, and uh, that works really well. And you can also use Suboxone. Let me make sure I got this. I got this from this class. It was a couple months ago. Always want to make sure I use the right terms here. That's a drug, right? It is. I always get the front line. Okay, Suboxone. I always get the front line in the uh, emergency medication. Narcan screwed up when I talk about this stuff. Anyway, uh, so it's Suboxone. So between Suboxone, which helps people ease off opioids, and contingency management, you could make this massive dent in the opioid crisis. So what are the problems? So Suboxone, uh, physicians are limited in the number of Suboxone patients they can treat. They're not limited in the number of patients they can give opioids to. Um, and that seems to have been greatly uh, <laughs> curbed recently. <laughs> yeah, so th th they definitely have uh, put a lot, they try to put more prescription, you know, there's social pressure, things like that on physicians not to give it, hand out opioids and things of that nature and pain medication. But there are, like, there are hard limits to the number of Suboxone patients you have because it's a, it was created later. And, um, and so it was, and there's these new laws, you're like, what if people abuse this? But the truth is it's much less bad for people than actual hardcore heroin, Percocets, et cetera. Uh, but we don't use it because, you know, there's these weird regulatory burdens. And the contingency management, people don't like it because it signals something like, oh, I'm not, I don't want to incentivize people. Like, I don't want them, what's the word? I, I, I guess there's almost a conservative approach that if you think you're paying someone not to do drugs, you're like, you know, they'll, they'll want to do drugs more because then they get paid. You know, I don't know, something weird like that. There's a great New York Times article about this recently. And it's like, wow, why don't we use this? So those are two, like, I like to call them twenty dollar bills lying on the sidewalk. So, it, you know the efficient market hypothesis. Yes. Eugene Fama, random walk down Wall Street. Just there's uh, you'd be crazy to bet on stocks because the market's efficient and everybody knows essentially what's going on, and um, you'd have to have better information or inside information to make money. Um, well. It, it, real life is much more complicated than that and there are oftentimes these easy not easy but shall we say simple um, things we could do that would make the world much better another example um cl with climate change nuclear power it's quite clean i think all of the nuclear waste ever produced would fit in like one football field or two football fields so it's like it's a tiny amount of nuclear waste it's quite clean um you know, Chernobyl is like in the back of everyone's mind, but that was so poorly. I mean, you can't imagine how poorly engineered uh, the system was and, you know, they were cost cutting it and it's gotten a lot safer now. We refuse to do it because of these things that have happened. And instead, we just end up keep burning. We keep burning coal, coal no natural gas. Maybe it's the Exxon Mobil lobbying for no nuclear that, you know, works. But that would happen. You know, so many more people are killed in like refinery explosions than in nuclear accent problems so you know that that's like a a clear gain that is uh it, it doesn't even require some massive it's not like flying cars right you don't have to figure out how to make your mazda fly through the wind you just have to implement this technology that we already have on the ground you just have to to figure out the the political problems associated with that which are sometimes more difficult Okay, now circle back around and pick up rivers again okay so we got rivers so we're talking about polymaths Let's see. What else? Are, Did we, we talk cover? about polymaths? So, uh, you know, it, we've covered. So, I, I guess we have talked about it. You know, the general trend of less polymaths. You know, we have less people that make contributions in multiple fields, and that that's kind of the general that's thing. That's not right? exactly what a po what do, exactly does polymath mean? Oh, uh, let me see. really means you have interest in a, a person learning. of wide ranging yeah. knowledge or learning that's what a polymath is yeah so i think there's probably more of those right now than any other time in history okay so i i okay i see i see what you're saying there's more people that are interested in more things i guess what i'm looking at in the lens of like some utilitarian there's less people that 
make a lot of accomplishments in many things. And then we could get going there because that, so that I knew that would be the, the first response. So um, we should start naming polymaths. Okay. Uh, th- that probably historically and then currently. Yeah. Like here's a polymath that popped to mind right away. Um, Steve Jobs, uh, not Steve Jobs, um, uh, Bill Gates. Bill Gates. Yeah, I guess nonprofit work and Microsoft. Although, interest, yeah, yeah, Paul, yeah, you can give it to Bill Gates. And not only that, I, th- I think he may have had more, be more effective than maybe any polymath that's ever existed before. Because if you look at his anti, you know, his, his vaccination programs, like his polio. Clean water programs, uh, the computer industry, I mean, you could go on and on. He's made a huge impact on the world. That's true. So it's it's kind of like his philanthropy and Microsoft, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I can see that. Yeah. So uh, now, now, try, now tell me one that a polymath 200 years ago that had, or 100 years ago or 50 years ago, that had even a similar effect. Hmm. Well, I'm trying to think. Yeah, there's t- tension here. So th- there's tension here between so like W. R. R. Rivers, you know. I guess I'm talking. I'm thinking of polymath as someone who is like creating scientific advancements in different fields. Okay, and we'll think I about that. I will give you one for my 200 years ago that you can think about. Okay, William Penn. Yeah, William Penn. He popped up on a uh, on a recent podcast. Yes, he definitely did. And and he had probably more effect on the modern world. Than maybe anyone. That's right, and few people talk about them. Yeah. So there's there's an example. So you, I think what you have to do is really open your mind to what polymath means. That's true. Expand your definition, perhaps. Um, yeah, that's true. I don't know. And that was like Leonardo da Vinci. Was that was he a polymath? Yeah, there's some thoughts like uh, well, there's a great article I was reading recently that maybe like you know his actual innovations are much smaller than like you know like we would, we would like to talk about. I I don't know. Um, it's true. It, it does seem like um, who else? Going Benjamin Franklin would be another example. A great example. Yeah, uh, that I w- that I would jump to first. But I'm trying to think of modern academics in our lifetime. And maybe that's one of the trip ups is you have to get away from the academic scene to to find people i think academics tend to do deep dives they tend to be uh real deep yeah but uh but not broad well and and that's kind of what i was getting to earlier is that it it has become that way yeah is that academia now is fairly static and people just focus on their super narrow subdomain to try and make progress and if you can move the ball half a yard forward you're successful but in reality, half a yard doesn't get you to the end zone. So, yeah, and it might be that we try to think of smart people. When now, here's another guy that I thought about him today was Elon Musk. That's true. I think Elon's probably a better example than the than Bill Gates of someone who's had yeah. Uh, but the, it's almost interesting. So the Elon example is good. I like this. I like this. The Elon example is interesting because everyone talks about him because he's in some sense the only one. Like, I think that makes him more special. Like, Howard Hughes, you know, you look at Howard Hughes, like he was uh, all these all these people that were just really far out there but making innovations in all these different areas. And suddenly now we're at this point where the only one really left is this one guy who lives in California. With more people. I mean, there are a lot more people now. Yeah. And it, it, it does, I mean, you. what did you tell me when... Uh, Elon Musk decided to get into rocketry. Yeah. The space exploration. Who did he read? So he goes back and starts reading Von Braun, right? <laughs> so like, yeah. Yeah, I, I was having this discussion recently, and we were talking about physicians that go and get extra degrees. So, I like, I think, I, I like, oh, man, I think this is, like, the dumbest. I'm sorry. I, I really do think, and I can say this because physicians are really smart people. You know what I mean? I. I think this is a, in general, a dumb thing to do. Because it it always ends up being the status signaling thing against other physicians. Like, oh, you're just an MD. I'm an MD with an MPH. 
you know, I'm an MD with an MBA. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, well, if you really just wanted the knowledge, wouldn't you just email the professor and like ask for some book recommendations? Because that's what I do. You know, so recently I, I had this question about, so there's this big paper on value affirmations and the achievement gap that was published in like nature or science, some huge, huge journal by the psychologist at Stanford. And it claimed, okay, we do this one value affirmations exercise like once every three months and it reduces the achievement gap by like 40%, 30%, like this huge effect. You know, it's a randomized controlled trial and I'm like, oh my God, this is huge. And if policymakers aren't using this, like what's going on? So my first thought is, is like, okay, that's really interesting. Maybe it just doesn't work. Maybe it's like, you know, he just like p-hacked something. He's a psychologist at Stanford and he just like cheated. And that, that's probably the most likely answer. So I was like, and I was reading more and he did some follow-ups and the effect size shrinks a little bit. But it's still like, you know, he's saying like this thing works. So I just found his email on Stanford's website and sent him a message. And I said, hey man, I, you know, I'm just like this lay person, but I'm really curious about this paper you wrote and here's the text and I read it and does this just not replicate or like why have you not implemented this? If this is like, it's this like 15 minute exercise and it has this huge, uh, it's like magic fairy dust essentially. Like it's so effective. Like it seems like we would all be dumb if we're not using this on for everybody. He hasn't gotten back to me yet. But my, my point being, you know, you can just email all these people and talk to the experts in the fields. And most of the time they get back to me, right? You know, and I'm just like this nobody, you know, North Carolina who has this weird question about their work. And a lot of times they'll get back to me like, oh, yeah, you think about it not exactly correctly. Um, here's a paper that I wrote on it that you can read and they'll just send it to me for free. And I'm like, oh, thanks. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's one cool. of the reasons that might work or, or, or be happy is because I think one of the best things to do, you can stand so close to the forest you can't see the trees and that's one of the things i think we're talking about is like if you're a polymath right lots of times it's about seeing the big picture it's not like how many angels can dance on the head of a pen right it's like what's an angel exactly you know, uh, it, 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 it's a broader more global thinking right so not knowing too much sometimes is an advantage because it changes perspective so much I think that's that's a good, that's well put. Yeah. So polymaths, have we color cover polymaths? I think so. So we circle around again. I think we should. All right. So how far have we gotten with H R R rivers? No H. W H R rivers. Too so many let's names. Let's see. Let's see. Did well. you talk about his nerve division? No, can you talk about that a little bit? So, I guess he was, I don't remember exactly what he was studying, but he got this idea to, to determine healing of nerves. I think that's what he was going to do. He and this colleague, you can never do this anymore, even if you want. Yeah. <laughs> he and this colleague decided what they'd do is they would sever the nerve in the colleague's hand and then sew <laughs> it back together and let it heal and see how the nerves appeared to regenerate. That was their idea, and they did really? that. And then they got together once a week for six months on Saturday. He came from London down to Oxford, I think, where they were. They get together, and they run all these little tests on his hands to uh, determine how things are regenerating. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> no way. That's amazing. That, yeah. That's the human experiment, nerve division. Yeah. And, and that's, yeah, that's, that's so fascinating. You did mention, you know, you can never do that today. And a lot of like, you know, the Nazis did a lot of very horrible things. And one of the long run effects that they, they have had on, on science is because of the terrible thing, things they did in concentration camps and, and experiments, um, rev, uh, ethical review boards are extremely stringent. And the example is always, okay, like, you, 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 if you mention that experiment, they'd be like, well, what about the Nazis, you know? Like, that was bad. And it was like, <laughs> yes, like, there was this very, very horrible thing, like, the most horrible thing that happened um, in the 1940s where these, these scientists were doing terrible stuff. But that's not what we're doing, right, you know? And you just can't be, you can't be a scientist and go out and, and try this stuff. And, and this is a great example because there's, I was reading a paper recently about how animal models are are pretty flawed 
when you're trying to do like, and this is one of the big problems with medicine. So like, you know, mice are not people and it, they just have all these different systems. And we, and we do things to try to make them better models, right? We really try. Um, but, you know, his example is like, you know, he's just trying this on his like his friend, right? You know, they're trying it on each other, you know, and, and getting um, these really interesting results, which is, which is cool and making these advances. And I think actually I'm going to get this story together the best I can and maybe you can fill in some of the blanks. Yeah. But the LSD and bicycle day are a big thing, right? I think so. Okay. So the guy that came up with LSD was just a chemist. Yeah, some German chemist. Yeah. And so um, so I guess he just tried it. See, he just right. Took, and you can imagine what it did. So one of his cohorts. Albert said, Hoffman, that was his name. <laughs> one of his cohorts, he told him he was going to take like a, a bigger dose or something. Yeah. And then they were going to go home, but he would, so he was going to ride his bicycle. He rode his bicycle home with his. Yeah. And so bicycle day has to do with the celebration of LSD. Really? I didn't know. That. That's amazing. We'll, we'll have to look that up and talk more about the future, but I'm pretty sure those two things are linked. That's super interesting. So again, something you couldn't do, <laughs> shouldn't do to yourself. Exactly. You couldn't do to anyone exactly. else. Okay. So, uh, and so you were talking about nerve regrowth. This actually <laughs> brings up another story I've been thinking about recently. Uh, you know, Zolpidem, uh, what is it, uh, Ambien? Yes. So have you ever heard of the Ambien effect? No. There's a great documentary on this by Vice a couple of years ago where they give um, Ambien to people who have uh, traumatic brain injuries or like uh, – uh, so, yeah, severe brain injuries, and it may not have been TBI, so don't quote me on that. It may have been uh, patients with dementia, you know, like not very responsive. They give them Ambien, and it's this short-term effect where they just suddenly start like talking and stuff like that. And it's like some GABA interaction, which I don't really understand. I don't think un- anyone really understands. Um, but it's like it's like there's all these weird effects in the human body and it's like, well, we can't really test them very well anymore. And it makes you wonder what else is out there. You know, like this is WHR rivers, you know, you're just like super cowboy. Right. Um, but it makes you wonder what else exists. Kind of neuron regeneration and connections. You know, it, it, it brings about the question of like, how much have we slowed progress through reg- regulation? The big example right now is these vaccines for the coronavirus. Right. right. It's like, obviously, we've slowed the development of drugs to a crawl of beneficial right. drugs because we don't want to dump money into it. We decide we're not going to do that. And because we're so we're just immobilized, paralyzed by f- apparently fear that there will be a negative effect. That's right. And we talked about this in the podcast with warning letters on warning letters. There are real trade-offs between safety, efficacy, quality control, and progress. And it's like a really hard line. And you have to have smart policymakers who understand the trade-offs um, and are willing to, to make the best call possible. Because this is an optimization problem, right? You don't want to be completely cowboy. You don't want bad things to happen. But you also do want progress to continue at pace. And we probably s- swung around to the, the wrong side of that now. In terms of safety, um, that's a great question because I'm after following what you can at a distance, which is all all you can do at the moment with right. the, with the test and the vaccine. I've been very much more of the opinion we're about this is about calibrated correctly. Interesting. There, there, there's obviously a lot of really smart people right. looking at the numbers, which is the way we ought to judge these things. It's a, it's a math game. Exactly. It's always a math game. And saying, you know, we've got to have these numbers to make it safe enough to put it to put it in effect in the population when it's really needed. Not just sort of cowboying it, just rolling it out there, but saying this is really, really thoughtfully done by people that really, really know the math and know the science. That's this really is good. what we can afford to do. Very cool. So and and you know, when Anthony Fauci says Yes, because I'm convinced he's one of the people that's always had a pulse on infectious disease. Right. Well, always for the last 30 years. Yeah. Um, when he says go, I don't care what anybody else says. When he takes it, I'm taking it. Yeah, and I definitely think there there was the head of Operation Warp Speed on 60 Minutes 
about a week ago. And he was talking about, okay, like, you know, I think it was like maybe Leslie Stahl or someone. She's like, you know, what's your biggest concern here? He's like, well, no one is going to take it when I, when I get it out there. And it turns out 60% of physicians surveyed would take it. And only about 40% of nurses who surveyed would take it. And that's a like big portion of both parties who are just like not going to take the vaccine. And there have been cases where vaccines have uh, had bad effects, but I do, I do think at the end of the day, you'd be better off taking the vaccine because I think the odds that it's worse than actually getting COVID, like I don't think there'll be a problem. And the odds that it's worse than get, actually getting COVID are very, very low, if that makes sense. So even if there are some negative effects, and you will get COVID if it continues like it is now. Like That's if we right. continue, like eventually, no matter, unless you just lock yourself inside, the rest of eternity, it's going to happen. You're going to get it. That's yep. right. It's one of those things that's going to happen. So uh, I, I just think the whole thing has been really, really well done. And I'm, I'm we're suspicious of it for some good reasons. But when you, know, you look at the numbers and you look how it's done, um, it, you know, science and math seems to be winning the day. Which is good. Yeah. Cool. What else do we have to cover? So, uh, the BHR Rivers. So, what's your final uh, what's your what's your final thoughts on the polymaths? What have you decided? Are there? I mean, I tend to think there's polymaths everywhere. There's a lot of them these days. And so, I think we're in a bear market. But I, I sense I think there's going to be a bull market in people who are making a lot of advancements in a lot of different fields soon. I think we've gotten to the point where good ideas are going to be very valuable much more valuable than they have been in the in the recent past so i I am actually bullish in people that believe that they can make things happen and go through it now uh some marks against me interest rates are like negative so what does that mean it's like well no one has any good ideas and and that's why i think like you know I don't think this is sustainable forever and i think that something's got to give and we're going to have to get back to good ideas and believing we can do it and, and building um, a, a better future in concrete ways for everyone. Good. All right. Well, interesting subject. Definitely. We'll include some links of uh, WHR Rivers and uh, you can read his, uh, in his bio and some of his lectures. They're quite interesting and good. Well, that's our show for today. I'm Will Jarvis. And I'm Will's dad. Join us next week for more narratives. 